welcome to London Vals 2023. I'm Ole de Bakker working in Copenhagen, Riesestel, Denmark. I have the honor to have a session here with uh, Darren Milet from Ireland and Kentaro Hayashida from Japan. The topic today we will discuss is what is the optimal aortic valve choice in the younger patients, transcatheter surgery or specific valves. So maybe Darren, first a question to you. What if we mention, if I mention younger patient, what do you understand on this? On this? Uh, that's a difficult one because I think it very much depends on the, on the individual patient in front of you. We've all seen 80 year olds who run marathons and seen 65 year olds who have multiple comorbidities or maybe a little, a little bit frailer. But ultimately, I think if we th that group usually is between about 65 and 75 years of age, that younger group that we think about, uh, that we think about valve choice, whether we should be thinking about a transcatheter or a surgical option. So yeah, for me, younger means 65 to 75. Mm -hmm. And is it then really strictly an, an, an age cutoff? Yep. Or do you think in more terminologies of life expectancy maybe of that patient or? Yeah, absolutely, as I, as, as I mentioned, um, you know, younger patients can have a great life expectancy or it can be quite short. You know, mm -hmm. we know patients, for example, with prior stroke, diabetes, yeah. coronary disease, they're gonna have a shorter life expectancy. Yeah. So when we think about the younger patient, mm -hmm. we have to think about a strategy to get them to the end of their life, be that expectancy five, 10 or 15 years. And I think the specifically the, the conversation around which valve choice in younger patients it really pertains to those patients yeah. who are 10 or 15 years of life left. Yeah, okay. And then Kentaro, indeed, if we then talk about the valve choice to make in these younger patients, whatever it is, surgery, transcatheter, balloon, self-expanding, the valves we have available there, what as aspects or characteristics of the patient or the anatomy or of the valve are important there to consider? Thank you very much, Ole. Actually, it's quite multifactorial and uh, we really need to maximize the uh, initial procedure success. And that's the reason why if the patient is uh, quite high risk for the surgery, uh, we really need to choose transcatheter uh, procedure. But nowadays, uh, we have really nice data on the uh, transcatheter procedures, and uh, we apply transcatheter procedure to uh, lower risk uh, patients as well. And uh, to maximize the initial success, we need to uh, avoid some complication like pacemaker implantation and the PBL. And we also need to have the uh, better coronary access uh, if the patient is much younger. And uh, what is most important is the durability. durability. And uh, we need to have the uh, very good durability of the bio processes. And if we think about the uh, second procedure, like the tab in tab or tab in sab, mm -hmm. and uh, I quite believe that the repeatability is quite important if we can do that or not. Okay. Super important aspects you, you bring up here on the table. I think then, do we have that data? What if we look to the data that was recently published or presented about the low risk trials, uh, the low risk trials with a longer follow up, four or five years? We even also have that uh, 10 year follow up from the notion. What, how do you distillate the data evidence there that impacts on that valve choice for these younger patients? So yeah, I think, I think this is super important data. And if we think about the low risk trials, what we've recently seen is four, four year data from Evolu, five year data from the partner low risk trial. We can't compare these two groups. These are two very different groups, two very different selection processes for these trials. But ultimately we see really good uh, hemodynamic and clinical data for both of these valve types compared to surgery. Surgery does well, transcatheter valves do well be them balloon expandable or self expandable devices. So what we're seeing is it's a good news story for our younger patients. We see that they have treatment options, that they have good surgical outcomes, they have good transcatheter options. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the, the armamentarium allows us to choose the best strategy for that individual patient. As Kintaro mentioned a few minutes ago, we need to move past the index procedure. We need to look towards that longer term data. And if you think about the notion, uh, the notion trial at nine and 10 years, yes, it's a small sample size, but we're seeing you know, exceptional hemodynamic data, very low rates of bioprosthetic valve dysfunction out to 10 years. That's just good news for our younger patients. I think if we look indeed to these, just regardless of the comparison with the surgical arms, whatever patients that were randomized, if we look to these longer term data, just purely for the transcatheter arm, they are indeed, I think, very promising. As Cantaro, do you have some 
How do you interpret these data from the low risk trial? Actually, the, uh, the, we have the five year or four year follow up for the low risk trial. And we're very much honored to be the part of Partner 3. And the uh, Partner 3 trial demonstrated the, uh, the very nice data on the sapient as well as the uh, Evolute low risk trial. And, uh, but we need to be careful that the, uh, we don't have the longer follow up data so far. We need to have the maybe 10 years follow up data. And uh -huh. what is most important is the uh, there is some exclusion from the low risk trial, like by Caspi anatomy exactly. or alveolar classification. So we should be careful to apply this data on our daily practice. Very good points. Okay, I think we can conclude the session with this. We had a great discussion. I think as a small summar uh, summary of this, I think first of all, if we talk about optimal aortic valve choice for our younger patients, there is good options. Surgery can be a really good option for some patients transcatheter based, I think a patient tailored choice there. I think you raised also an important point. If we really talk about long term data, it should be like 10 to 15 years almost. So we're still waiting, eagerly waiting for these data. And also by cuspid. I mean, we have rather limited data in the bike cuspid. So I think our job is not done. We still work uh, in front of us, but we have great data already and promising data in the future looks great from that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Oli.